Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus, Consul 59 BCE, best hell only known as Caesar's unfortunate colleague in 59, Bibulus is usually regarded as either a footnote or a joke, and in the footnotes where he's included, he's almost always a joke. Bibulus was more or less overridden by Caesar during the entirety of their consulship, leading many wits of the time to call it the year of Julius and Caesar, rather than the year of Caesar and Bibulus. Because of how easily he was overridden by Caesar, Bibulus tends to be overlooked or simply laughed at. However, in this video, I'd like to advance the idea that Bibulus was actually a fairly well-regarded senator during his time, and that had it not been for Caesar and the First Triumvirate, that Bibulus would have been regarded as one of the greatest men in Rome. And in fact, we'll see that later in his career, he did a good deal to redeem himself and to get his career back on track after the many-fold disappointments of 59. Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus was most likely born in the year 102 BCE, and if not that year, then most likely not more than one or two years before that date. Bibulus is most famous as Caesar's consular colleague, but the two men were actually colleagues throughout their shared journey on the Cursus Honorum. Bibulus, we think, was two years older than Caesar precisely because Caesar, as a patrician, was allowed under the Solon order to hold offices two years earlier than his plebeian colleagues, and we know that Bibulus was from one of the most prominent plebeian houses. Therefore, he would be about two years older than Caesar, hence the dating. We actually don't have an independent attestation of Bibulus's age. Bibulus served as curule edile in 65. This office is charged with maintaining public buildings and regulating public festivals. Bibulus did well enough, most likely. However, that year was really stolen by Caesar, who held the same office, and put on the Ludi Romani, the Roman games, which were not held very often, and which Caesar held in grand fashion, incurring quite a bit of debt along the way. In the year 62, both Bibulus and Caesar were praetors, and this was when the conspiracy of Catiline really broke out, and when Roman officials were tasked with putting it down. Caesar, because he had expressed the opinion that the Catalinarians should be treated with mercy, was not entrusted with any commands. However, as a reliable optimate, Bibulus was entrusted with the command of a Praetorian army, and he was sent into eastern Italy to suppress the Catalinarians there. So, so far, he's had a pretty distinguished career, even if it's nothing spectacular. And as someone from a noble plebeian house, Bibulus has every expectation of making the consulship one day. However, it's around this time, right after 62 and leading up to 59, his first year of eligibility, when the political landscape in Rome shifts dramatically. Just prior to the year 60, Pompey the Great returned home to Rome, having acquired a new name, Magnus the Great. While he had done a great deal of service for Rome in fighting Sertorius, Mithridates, and others, his real accomplishment had been his eastern settlement, where he had conquered and organized a large swath of territory in the east in the name of Rome. However, this left him needing the Senate's approval to confirm all of the various arrangements that he had made with local rulers. In addition to that problem, he had many veterans who had come home with him and were expecting to be discharged, paid, and given land for their service. Many of the more conservative senators, senators the Optimates or the Boni, decided that it was too dangerous to let Pompey pull off his eastern settlement and that if he were able to do that, then he would become too powerful, and he would therefore threaten their prerogatives. So, accordingly, in the year 60, Pompey had one consul elected, his good friend Lucius Afranius, who had been his right-hand man in the east, and on the other side, the Optimates had Quintus Caecilius Metellus Caler. The year 60 was just a long, never-ending political battle in the Senate between these two consuls, and it appears that Metellus Keller was both a better politician and someone who had more senators on his side, 
Pompey's legislation was repeatedly defeated and Afranius was a complete failure as a consul. His skill was entirely on the battlefield. So this problem was not going away and it is dangerous to not pay and settle veterans. Sulla had a similar issue in the past and that had ended in a dictatorship. So what ended up happening is that because Metellus Keller was so effective at obstructionism, Pompey knew that he could not achieve his objectives alone and that he would need to seek out other major power players in Rome in order to override the majority of the Bonni. And to form a new majority, he had to turn to Julius Caesar, who was a candidate for 59 and someone who was known as a very good politician. And he also turned to Crassus, who after himself was the second richest man in Rome. And together they formed the first triumvirate. One thing that they had in common is that they had most of the same enemies in common. In fact, if you really want to see the true cause of the first triumvirate, I say that the real cause is the Bonny faction itself. But that's a different story for a different day. In 59, Caesar was running on the understanding that he would pull off Pompey's legislation, while the Optimates, for their part, did not really have a strong act to follow up Metellus Keller. So this is where Bibulus comes in. Going into 59, the Bonnie had been successful at holding their would-be rivals at bay. While Pompey had achieved great things, they were able to stymie all of his efforts through obstructionism in the Senate. Pompey had more money than most of the Bonnie put together, but it wasn't by a completely overwhelming margin. Crassus was also wealthy enough to be a threat, but he wasn't all that popular. Caesar was a great politician, but he was deeply in debt because his family had fallen on hard times in the lead up to his political career. So when the three men joined forces, this really made the Bonnie hit the panic button. What they saw was not only the rise of two men whom they despised, Crassus and Caesar, but the elevation to Pompey to the position that they had feared that he might acquire if they had allowed him to get what he wanted in the first place. So things ended up getting worse because of their success in 60. And the stakes in 59 were so high that the Bonnie, including Cato the Younger, who was a moralist par excellence, they all agreed that it was necessary to bribe the electorate to get one of their candidates in to try to offset Julius Caesar and engage in obstructionism. They also made sure to get three tribunes who were on their side. The man they settled upon as their candidate was Bibulus. What was in Bibulus's favor? I assume that it was mostly just that he was seen as a reliable person. His views were very staunchly of the Bonny persuasion. He was on good terms with Cato, we know that for certain, and we can assume that he was also on decent terms with Metellus Calaire and the other major figures in the movement. So, the Bonny all poured their resources into Bibulus's election. Now, the person who would have most likely won had Bibulus not had all the support was Lucius Lucius. And in fact, Lucius Lucius was so disgusted by what had happened that he retired to write history and never partook in politics again. In fact, he was one of the many people who was approached by Cicero to write a history of Cicero's consulship. Lucius declined, and that was what led Cicero to write his infamous epic about his consulship, which in ancient times was largely mocked as one of the worst epics ever, but unfortunately it hasn't survived, so we have no idea how bad it actually was. But suffice it to say, it appears that Cicero's talent was limited to prose. Caesar lost no time in moving forward with his legislative agenda. He went on the Senate floor and put up a bill to officially discharge and settle Pompey's long neglected veterans. However, to prevent this from occurring, Metellus Calaire led a mass walkout of the Bonni in order to prevent a vote. He denied them quorum, in other words. In the eyes of the Bonni, this meant that without being able to hold a vote in the Senate, Caesar would be unable to legitimately or officially get this bill passed. 
Caesar lost no time in doing what Afranius dared not. He called upon the Centuriate Assembly. This is an assembly in Rome which was able to pass laws and which held sovereignty. If the Centuriate Assembly passed a law, the Senate was supposed to uphold that law and confirm its legitimacy. Pompey's veterans were present in large numbers in Rome, possibly because they were really amped up to pass this bill, but also possibly because they were unemployed and had nowhere else to be. I imagine there was a pretty strong confluence of those two factors. Pompey's veterans were so prominent that not only could they really help determine the outcome of a vote, but they also could help intimidate anybody who might want to engage in obstructionism. So effectively what they did, or what the Bonnie did, I mean, is that they prevented a Senate vote and more or less forced Caesar to engage in practices which they, the Bonnie, deemed to be illegitimate although these practices were long ingrained in the Roman Constitution. Going into the Centuriate Assembly, where some of the tribunes and possibly Caesar himself spoke in favor of Pompey's legislation, some of Pompey's veterans approached Bibulus, who was present, to express their desire to receive their due. However, Bibulus dismissively waved off their concerns and said that he didn't care what they wanted. Now, since the crowd was overwhelmingly in favor of Caesar and Pompey, this meant that Bibulus had really tarnished his own credibility in the eyes of the crowd and especially of Pompey's veterans. Bibulus went to the three tribunes who were pro boni and told them to veto Caesar's bill. And while the tribunes were supposed to be sacrosanct and not subject to any kind of violence, lest someone offend the gods, these three tribunes knew that Pompey's veterans were not there to play softball, so they wisely chose not to impose their vetoes. Bibulus's next move, which would become his go-to over the following year, was to claim that he had seen ill omens which invalidated the assembly's vote. Unfortunately for Bibulus's form of obstructionism, his consular colleague, Julius Caesar, was both an augur and the Pontifex Maximus, so his authority on these matters was supreme, and he was able to say that Bibulus was mistaken and ordered the vote to continue. So now the vote is being cast. While the various tribes were casting their votes, Bibulus led a vigorous protest on the steps of the Temple of Castor and Pollux, and since he didn't have that large of a following, it most likely would have just been Bibulus, some of his friends, maybe some of his entourage, his slaves, freedmen, and then his lictors. And it's unclear exactly what his protest consisted of, but I imagine given the harsh words that he had had for Pompey's veterans, that he was saying things that the crowd did not like. So the crowd turned on him and attacked him. The crowd seized and broke Bibulus's fasces, his symbol of office, and then pushed him to the ground, and someone happened to have a chamber pot on hand, so they poured some shit on him. This most likely means that someone who lived nearby went home to fetch their chamber pot and brought it for the specific purpose of throwing it on Bibulus. He must have been berating them for some time. Now, Bibulus was deeply humiliated by having his symbol of authority shattered and then being literally shit on. So he leapt up from the ground, bared his throat to the crowd, and begged them to kill him right then and there to end his humiliation. He would not be treated this way by the people he was representing. However, before Bibulus's suicidal wishes could be fulfilled, his friends managed to calm him down and usher him to safety. This was most likely one of the scariest moments in Bibulus's life, and the time when he was closest to facing death from the hands of an enemy. The next day, still furious, Bibulus made a formal complaint in the Senate about the treatment that he had received, and he asked that the Senate annul the law that the Centuried Assembly had just passed, but they did not do so. Technically, the Senate was an advisory body, whereas the various assemblies of Rome had sovereign authority. While the Senate often did act as if it were a sole organ of government, the fact is that it did not have the authority to override the will of the assemblies. So no one backed him on this proposal. 
Caesar and his allies then decided to add insult to injury by pressuring Bibulus to take an oath to uphold the new law, and he had no legal recourse to not do so, since he knew as well as anybody else that the assembly's authority was sovereign. After this, however, he felt sufficiently humiliated and possibly a little betrayed by his own allies, so he decided to just stay home. He pulled up classic Cartman, screw you guys, I'm going home. So starting in March, Bibulus did not attend another meeting of the Senate. And this led many of the wits of this era to call the year 59 the year of Julius and Caesar, since, of course, there was really only one council in a meaningful sense. From home, Bibulus continued to complain about Caesar, and he often tried to implicate him in the so-called First Catalinarian Conspiracy. If you're familiar with the story of the Catalinarian Conspiracy, then you know that almost everything that counts as an event occurred during the second phase of the conspiracy. And in fact, many historians think the First Catalinarian Conspiracy was not even a real thing. So it's possible that Bibulus, in his now abundant free time, more or less invented the First Catalinarian Conspiracy out of thin air. Bibulus also claimed to be watching for omens, and his thinking was that he could provide a legal grounds to invalidate all of Caesar's legislation later if he claimed that as a sitting consul he was seeking omens. This is similar to when Metellus Calaire led the great walkout and forced Caesar to go to the assembly, the idea being that Caesar can get away with passing laws, but they will all be illegitimate. The effectiveness of Bibulus's tactics is not exactly clear. Obviously, the Bonnie all thought that this was legitimate, but it doesn't seem like most people really thought that Bibulus had a leg to stand on on this particular issue. So why did he stay home other than to think up conspiracies, hurl insults at Caesar as the Queen of Bithynia, and watch for omens? Well, actually, my thought on this is that he was probably convinced by someone close to him that he needed to stay home. He had nearly died, and then the next day the Senate had been indifferent to his suffering and made him take an oath to uphold a law that he clearly disagreed with. So perhaps his wife or someone else close to him convinced him to stay home because they knew that he was a bit of a hothead and that he could get himself killed in these increasingly tumultuous times. But again, this is just a pet theory of mine. Maybe he actually thought that this was a brilliant political strategy. Who knows? When it comes to prominent people, whether they be celebrities or politicians, there are two kinds of comebacks. There is the full comeback of the Robert Downey Jr. variety, and there is the quasi-comeback of the Kevin Sorbo variety. A quasi-comeback, to use the example of Kevin Sorbo, is when you're a major star in the 90s and you come back in the 2010s in a Christian propaganda film called God's Not Dead. You have several interviews where you talk about your beliefs, and then you fade away into obscurity. Bibulus had a quasi-comeback. In the middle of his term, if Cicero was to be believed at least, Bibulus's popularity started to recover. Now, unfortunately, Cicero does not clarify among whom Bibulus was popular. Was he popular among the Bonni, who were growing tired of Caesar and had been tired of him before he even took office, or was he gaining some sympathy among the common people? Well, it appears maybe he gained a little bit of sympathy among some of the common people who thought that some of Caesar's strong-arm tactics went a little bit too far. But it's hard to say. It's also possible that because Metellus Calaire fell dead suddenly in the middle of Caesar's consulship, that people began to look at Bibulus as his natural successor. And maybe they began to petition him more and to visit his home more and to pay him more attention. But again, it's not really clear exactly what kind of a comeback Bibulus was mounting, just that there was a little bit of buzz. In July, Bibulus decided to use his powers, and he tried to delay the next consular election until October 18th. Exactly why he tried to do this is unclear, but I have to assume that he too was convinced that the popularity of the triumvirate was fading, and that if he could delay the election by a bit, 
then that popularity would wane even further and give the Bonny a better chance of holding more offices for the next year. However, this plan, such as it was, was foiled when one of the seven tribunes loyal to Caesar accused Bibulus and his would-be successor for 58 of being involved in a plot to murder Pompey. Whether this plot was real or not, I cannot say. Bibulus said that he had tried to warn Pompey months earlier about this plot, but that Pompey had not acknowledged his warning. P Bibulus was scheduled to leave his home for the first time in months and testify in court about this plot, but he never had to go because the day before he was scheduled to testify, his accuser was murdered. The year 59 was really the first year of what you could call the bad 50s in Rome, where murder in the streets was very common. And in fact, many of Rome's most prominent politicians would be either abused in some way or murdered. Bibulus going into the end of his consulship should have been pretty well rested, and he had had sufficient time to even invent his own conspiracy theory. However, he still had not quite come up with the obstructionist tool that would enable him to actually achieve anything. As his final official act as consul, Bibulus strove to prevent Caesar from attaining his five-year proconsular command in Gaul by claiming ill omens. But of course, this was something that he had tried a few times already, and it had never worked. Once again, Julius Caesar was both an augur and the Pontifex Maximus, so he was the go-to authority on omens, and if you claim that the omens were against him, he could just tell you that you're wrong, and based on Roman ideas of hierarchy, that was all she wrote. And also, Caesar had the support of Pompey, and one of the consul elects for the next year who was in the triumvirate faction named Gabinius. So that was all that was needed. Caesar was confirmed and that was that. So now Bibulus is out of office and he has to report back to the Senate, which he will resume attending. When he came back, he took the traditional oath that he had performed his duty and then he began to deliver a speech to justify his actions. However, one thing that he didn't count on is that maybe there were people on the other side of the aisle who had no interest in hearing what he had to say. And the Tribune Publius Clodius Polcare, who would soon become one of the most famous or maybe infamous men in Rome, used his veto authority to prevent Bibulus from finishing his account. So Bibulus went out with a whimper or maybe a stutter, or maybe he screamed as he was dragged off. But at any rate, he did not have a big impact as consul, and even his last minute efforts did not bear fruit. Now that his consulship had ended, Bibulus was free to attend the Senate and hear all of the reports from Gaul, where Caesar was conquering Rome's oldest enemy and also becoming one of the most famous figures in all of world history in the process. So while he listened to all of this depressing news, how did Bibulus stand among his colleagues? And in particular, how did he rank among the Bonni? Because of Cicero's outsized influence on our thinking about the politics of the Republic, most historians are comfortable with the idea that Cato the Younger was the undisputed leader of the Optimates. However, there are a few issues with this. First of all, Cato was several years younger than most of the senior officials on that side of the aisle. And he also did not have the highest rank in Rome. While Cato was from one of the most famous families in Rome, he never attained the consulship. He was only ever a praetor. And you could say with fairness that the reason why he never was able to attain the consulship is because the triumvirate hated him and made sure that he never made it. However, the fact remains that he did not hold that office, and without that office, there was a limit to the extent of his honor in the official sense. Roman honor was based very much upon honors received and granted by the Senate and people of Rome. And without holding Rome's highest magistracy, Cato could not really be the leader of a faction. He was one of the most dynamic speakers in the Senate. He certainly had a following. People looked up to him, but when push came to shove, 
no one would officially grant him the title of leader. So who did lead the Bani? Well, Lucius Lucullus in the 60s was the most prominent member of this group, if we could describe that group as having existed at the time. He was Pompey's chief rival until he got cheated out of the Mithridates command, at which point he came home, retired from politics, and gave himself over to pleasure and fish ponds. After that, the mantle of leadership passed to Metellus Calaire, who really became a legend among the Bani for his successful obstructionism against Lucius Afranius and Pompey's agenda. But then he had dropped dead in the middle of 59, and this left a void. What I'm proposing is that while Cato may have been the best speaker of the Bani, that actually Bibulus was most likely the official leader. And when I say official leader, I'm using these terms as loosely as possible, because of course these parties did not exist in any formal sense. However, Bibulus as the senior person on that side, or one of them, would have been more important in Senate debates than Cato, since he would have gotten to speak earlier, and since he would have been guaranteed to speak as someone who had held the dignity of the consulship. Between 58 and 53, some point during that time, Bibulus married Cato's daughter Portia and remained her husband until his death. So even if Cato were more or less the leader of the Bani, Bibulus would have at worst been his chief lieutenant. As an ex-consul, Bibulus had to have retained his standing among the Bani. Um, they needed all the prominent people they could get, and he had not disgraced or betrayed them. He had only really failed in what was most likely an impossible task. Again, if you look at the kind of resources the Triumvirate mustered going into 59, Bibulus had no chance. And I think that most of the people who were on his side understood that. Um, so even if his overall standing with the public had taken a hit, and even if he wasn't exactly popular with the crowds, I think it's safe to say that among the Bonnie, and even maybe among the Senate as a larger body, Bibulus still had some clout, and we shouldn't forget that. During the 50s, the Triumvirate more or less controlled Rome from top to bottom, and this meant that for members of the Bonnie, such as Bibulus and his father-in-law Cato the Younger, there weren't all that many opportunities to gain distinction. However, Bibulus did manage to lead a few political fights and enjoyed some success and prominence. With Caesar away in Gaul, Bibulus decided to direct his anger toward Pompey, and he attacked Pompey so vigorously in the Senate that Pompey actually suspected that Bibulus was plotting against his life. However, we have no way of knowing if Bibulus's wrath went beyond words. Bibulus voted against Pompey going to Egypt to restore Ptolemy XII in 56 to 55. It seems that Bibulus was the leader of the movement against Pompey being appointed to this potentially very profitable endeavor. Another senator, I believe it was Gabinius, got the appointment instead. By the late 50s, as the triumvirate began to fall apart, Crassus died, and then Joia, the daughter of Julius Caesar and wife of Pompey, died. Bibulus was among the men who started to cozy up to Pompey. Now, whether Bibulus and Pompey ever kicked back bruise or not, I don't know, but certainly on a political level, the two of them began to see more eye to eye. Pompey had previously passed a law in Rome reforming the pro-magistracy system so that there would be a gap between holding a consulship or praetorship and then holding a governorship. And part of that was to create more opportunities for people to go to the provinces and govern since there were openings in the provinces. This meant that many former consuls who had opted out of performing a pro-consulship were now sent to different places. And among the men who was sent to a province was Bibulus, who was appointed to serve in Syria starting in 51. Now, if you know anything about Syria in this period, you know that this was a very good opportunity for Bibulus. Before Bibulus arrived in Syria, opportunity arose for him. On May 6, 53 BCE, Crassus and the bulk of his army were wiped out at the Battle of Carai. This was one of the most devastating losses in Roman history. 
Of course, Rome easily made good their losses, since they had a record number of legions around this time, and it didn't result in Rome losing any territory, but it was still humiliating and also sent shockwaves throughout the Roman world. For the next two years, until Bibulus' arrival, the proquister Gaius Cassius Longinus was able to rally the survivors of Crassus's army and defend Syria from the Parthians. Bibulus then arrived in 51 and oversaw some minor operations and mild reorganization. Basically, Cassius had already figured out what to do and Bibulus just completed the process. However, that's not the way that the Senate saw it. Maybe Bibulus wrote up his own accomplishments, or maybe the Senate was eager to honor one of their own, someone who was not a member of the Triumvirate and whose prestige needed to be bolstered in order to offset the prestige of the Triumvirs. At any rate, whatever the merits of Bibulus's deeds, the Senate gave him 20 days of thanksgiving, which was an incredible honor, and this reflects both their desire to promote Bibulus and also their happiness that the disaster at Karai had been repaired. Of course, Cassius was not happy about this, and the army in Syria was not happy about it either, since they had done all of the actual work, and Bibulus had just come along and taken the credit. But for Bibulus, this does restore his prestige if it needed any restoration after his consulship. So this helps his career immensely. However, during this period, he also suffered a terrible personal tragedy. And therefore, even though this was the greatest moment of his career, it may have actually been one of the worst moments of his life. When he first arrived in the East, Bibulus thought that he would need more soldiers in order to shore up Syria. So he sent his two adult sons to Egypt in order to recall some Roman veterans who had settled down there. However, they did not see themselves rallying to the standards, so in order to avoid military service, they murdered Bibulus's sons. Now, I guess they thought that they could get away with this because Bibulus at this point represented the Roman Republic and they were living in Egypt under the writ of Cleopatra. However, Cleopatra VII was an adept politician and she understood that allowing the murder of Roman officials on her soil would lead to war and the end of her independence. So she quickly moved to appease Bibulus. She apprehended the murderers and had them sent to Bibulus for punishment. However, he sent them back because officially it was the Senate's prerogative to punish the wrongdoers. And I find this to be an interesting insight into Bibulus's beliefs and character. Now, clearly he did not respect the assembly despite its official capacity but he very much did believe in the prerogatives of the Senate, even when it concerned his own personal interest. He most likely could have gotten away with killing the murderers, even though it was illegal, simply because they had left the Roman Empire and because they well, were murderers. Um, but he decided not to. He decided to obey custom in this uh, instance because the prerogative that he would violate would be the prerogative of the institution that he valued most dearly. So while Bibulus did have a temper, as we've seen in earlier instances, he also did have some principles, and those principles held true even at his time of greatest personal distress. By all appearances, Bibulus was still governing Syria at the time that Caesar crossed the Rubicon in early 49. If he already had left his post, he probably had not made it home yet, which was just as well since he would have had to leave immediately. So Pompey, of course, retreated to Epirus when Caesar invaded Italy and reorganized. When Bibulus arrived in the camp of Pompey and the conservative senators, he was one of the few senators on that side with recent military experience. As an ex-consul and an outspoken person among the Bani, Bibulus was an important ally for Pompey to cultivate. So Pompey accordingly gave Bibulus an important command, the Adriatic fleet and the job of preventing Caesar from crossing with his army. Bibulus took his new duties very seriously, and as we'll see, he performed them with a good deal of competence.
stationing his fleet at Corsaira, which is the modern city of Corfu in western Greece, Bibulus thought that his fleet would be inactive during the winter of 49 to 48. He most likely was worried about Caesar trying to cross his entire army in the early spring of 48, so he was preparing his fleet. However, he then received news that Caesar had ferried over two legions, so he hurriedly uh, got his fleet together and sailed north. He managed to intercept the enemy fleet on its way back to Italy, and he captured and burned 30 transport vessels. Now, while this was not the entirety of the Caesarian fleet, it was a considerable chunk, and the burning of those 30 transports would impede Mark Antony's ability to get the other legions on board and get them to Epirus to reinforce Caesar. After this point, Bibulus was extraordinarily vigilant at blocking any further supplies to Caesar, and while his success rate was not that great, we have to remember that Caesar was not confined to a narrow port, so maintaining an effective blockade under ancient naval conditions was not easy. Bibulus did manage to capture one privateer, and he had the entire uh, crew executed for not following his orders to not reinforce Caesar with supplies. So while Bibulus didn't have any outstanding successes, he was clearly working really hard, but that did have one negative impact. Ancient fleets were a bit fragile. They sailed in wooden ships, and these ships could become easily waterlogged. So while Bibulus was doing good work, his fleet was becoming increasingly ragged as the time came near when Antony would no doubt try to cross the Adriatic. Over the winter of 49 to 48, Caesar and his two legions were in a perilous position. They were outnumbered by Pompey, they had no clear path of retreat, and they were not really receiving very many provisions by ship due to the effectiveness of Bibulus's blockade. However, this cut both ways. Maintaining a blockade is very difficult under ancient sailing conditions. So Bibulus's ships and sailors were ragged, and one of the things that happens with ancient triremes is that if they're out in the water too long without being beached and dried out, they become waterlogged, which makes them slower and therefore less effective at doing their job. Not to mention that they have to spend quite a bit of time on shore to collect provisions. So this meant that Bibulus's men might be a little bit on the hungry or thirsty side as well, as having to try to row ships which are a little heavier than they should be. To gain a reprieve, Bibulus tried to trick Caesar's legates into a truce so that he could safely land and resupply. This would enable him to keep up the blockade at full strength and hopefully be in a position to intercept Antony when he arrived. However, Bibulus didn't quite play this the right way, because he was proposing that they talk about peace in general, but then he gave away his true intentions when Caesar asked him to ensure the safety of some envoys that Caesar planned to send to Pompey, and then Bibulus refused to do so, because Bibulus had no actual interest in sending envoys to Pompey to talk about peace. This was his operation that he was trying to pull off in order to replenish his ships. And Caesar knew something was afoot, maybe not exactly what, but he had a good enough guess to know not to trust Bibulus, and therefore there was no truce, and Bibulus did not get to refit his ships for a few days. Overworked, after having spent the last year as Pompey's admiral-in-chief, Bibulus fell ill and died in early 48 near Corsaira. His successor, Lebo, was in command when Antony finally crossed with the rest of Caesar's army. This, of course, set the stage for the battles of Dyrrachium and Pharsalus. Had Bibulus lived and retained command, it's hard to say whether he could have done better than Lebo. Keep in mind that in ancient times it was extraordinarily difficult to intercept even a fleet. So, perhaps Bibulus would not have done better than his successor. However, had he lived, he most likely would have continued to provide valuable service to the Pompeian cause. One has to imagine that had Bibulus taken command at Thapsus rather than Metellus Scipio, that the Pompeians would have had at least a little bit better of a chance at winning. Also, it would have been more fitting, narrative-wise, for Caesar and Bibulus to be the two opponents during one of Caesar's final victories in the Civil War, since their careers had paralleled one another so closely. 
But, of course, it didn't happen. Despite his failed consulship, Marcus Calpurnius Bibulus was easily one of the most highly regarded and important men in the Optimate camp. In fact, I was mentally trying to name the most important men of the 50s in Rome, and it occurs to me that Bibulus is almost certainly among the top 10. Now, granted, I can't make a case for putting him higher than 8, but he there's hard to think of too many people who were more important than him over the course of the decade, at least in terms of Roman politics. So, he is definitely someone worth considering and remembering, even if we can't really place him at the top of the heap of Roman politicians. That being said, had Bibulus had the good fortune of having a colleague who was not Julius Caesar, I'm sure that his career would have proceeded much more smoothly. Although without Bibulus, we could not have had the year of Julius and Caesar, and for that we should thank him.